COM 105, Introduction to Mass Media, Chapter 8, Falling in Love or Like Online. For your consideration, how important is physical touch to a relationship? What is meant by the concept of social capital? What is the distinction between weak and strong ties, and why is it important when studying communication technology? Do you think you can fall in love online? It would seem hard when you lack so many nonverbal cues, particularly touch. Are online relationships really difficult from relationships formed face-to-face? -face? Can they work at all? When we are trying to form a relationship with somebody, which do you think is better, talking with them online or talking with them offline? Just how important is touch? Touch is also referred to as haptic communication, and it is a major way that we communicate with one another. It's not just humans who communicate with touch. In his now famous experiments, scientist Harry Harlow found that baby monkeys preferred to cuddle up to a soft terry cloth mother monkey that provided nothing more than comfort and physical touch over a hard cold wire mother who provided food. The monkeys actually would prefer to stay with the mother that didn't provide food than the one that did because the mother that didn't provide food was soft and cuddly. Humans can use touch to communicate all different types of emotions and feelings. We can use hugs or kisses in order to express romance, a high five to express friendship, or a punch to express that we don't really like someone so much. Is touch really so great? Have you ever been made uncomfortable if someone you didn't like or don't know put their hand on you? Touch can act as an expectancy violation, and there are times when we are just not expecting to be touched. It makes us feel very uneasy. There are also different places that we prefer different people to be in terms of our personal space. For example, 0.5 meters or closer is considered intimate space. It's okay for people that we're very close to, such as romantic partners or close friends, to be this close to us. People that we're less familiar with, acquaintances or people we've just met, we would prefer to keep at about 1.2 meters or further away. For people that we don't know at all, we prefer a social distance at 3.0 meters or further away. If someone that you don't know gets into your intimate space, that can make you feel uncomfortable. Further, are there times when touch just isn't needed? Do you need to touch your server or want to touch them when you order a cheeseburger? In many instances, a doctor may be able to diagnose and even treat a disease more effectively by looking at your x-rays and blood work than by being present in the exam room with you. Although virtual reality technology is limited as of now, New advances in this technology may allow us to one day be able to touch each other in a digital space. As we talked about in Chapter 7, we use social networking sites to maintain our relationships, but what is a social network? Social networks are a lot older than the internet. In fact, it's something humans have been doing for basically forever. A social network is an organization of individuals and connections. An individual person in a network is referred to as a node. Each node has a connection with other nodes forming an entire network. This means that social networks are a combination of connections and individual nodes. There are many ways that social networks can be organized. One method of network is called a bucket brigade. In this network, one node is connected to another node in a linear path. Imagine a line of people carrying buckets of water down a row to put out a fire. Another network type is the telephone tree. This is a type of network in which one person is responsible for connecting all others, who then connect with even more people. Much as with the Bucket Brigade, information in this tree flows in one direction. In our social networks, usually we share information in many different ways, not just in one direction. But like the telephone tree, some nodes will be more central and will have more connections than others. Here you can see how social networks tend to form. You have individual nodes, their connections, and then clusters of nodes. In the center of this diagram, you can see how there are lots of nodes that all come together. This is called a cluster. On the other hand, there are some nodes with only one connection to other nodes in the entire network. These are called outliers. We can understand social networks in terms of ties. A group or network involves group members who, because of their frequent interaction, tend to think alike over time. This reduces the diversity ideas and in worst case leads to groupthink. Groupthink is the tendency for a group of individuals to agree on something without actually thinking things through, only because other members of the group tend to agree with it. Weak ties are the relationships between members of different groups. 
They're utilized infrequently and therefore don't need a lot of management to stay healthy. They lead to a diversity of ideas as they tie together disparate modes of thought. Strong ties are relationships between people who work, live, or play together. They are utilized frequently and need a lot of management to stay healthy. Over time, people with strong ties tend to think alike, as they share their ideas all the time. One thing that's interesting about online social networks is that it makes it very transparent to see strong ties and weak ties, in that people in your direct circle of friends, people you have strong ties with, however, you might also have friends that you don't live, work, or play with that you're also connected to on a social networking site. Similarly, there are people in your friends group who will have ties to others that are outside of your network. There are five rules of social networks. First of all, we shape our networks. That is, for the most part, we choose who we connect with. Much of this choice is based on the concept of homophily. Homophily is the extent to which two people are similar to each other. Generally speaking, we like people who are pretty similar to us. We want to be around people who have the same general values and ideals that we have. And as such, the people in our social networks that we're closest to are going to be people who are similar to us. Next, our networks shape us. Your entire, entire social network shapes who you are as a person. People in your network may add new trends, new ideas, or new habits to your life. You can also think about how the type of network a person is involved in affects them in different ways. For example, someone with many close friends would be affected potentially different by each one of those friends than someone with very few but very strong friendships. Next, our friends affect us. Your individual friends affect you, just plain and simple. You can think of all kinds of ways that your friends can affect you. Maybe they could introduce you to a new trend, to a new hobby. Maybe you could go watch a new movie together. It's not surprising that our friends have an important impact on us. Four, our friends, friends, friends affect us. Although it makes sense that our direct friends have an impact on our lives, as it turns out, your friends, friends, friends also have an impact. If your friends are affecting you, who is affecting your friends? It's you and your friends' other friends as well. That means that you could be being affected by not some, your friend indirectly, but by your friend's friend. Finally, the network has a life of its own. It changes, gaining and losing nodes, and reorganizing itself through new emergent connections. One single network is never going to look the same over time. The network does change. As said, some nodes may leave the network. This could be because the person left the area or because unfortunately they died. There could be also new nodes, new friendships, or new relationships that become part of the network. Connections can sever and be reformed. Maybe two friends who in your network decide to break up. That connection is now severed. However, a new connection between different nodes could be established. In this way, social networks are essentially like living creatures. They constantly change and evolve. Have you ever heard of the term six degrees of Kevin Bacon? The term originates from a trend in movies for actors to be more or less connected to Kevin Bacon within six steps, through movies that they have been in with him or with other actors who have been in a movie with him. An actor who is in a movie with Kevin Bacon is one degree separated from Kevin Bacon. An actor who was in a movie with an actor who co-starred in a movie with Kevin Bacon is there two degrees separated from Kevin Bacon. And an actor who was in a movie with an actor who was in a movie with an actor who was in a movie with Kevin Bacon is three degrees separated from Kevin Bacon. The concept of six degrees of separation comes from a classic experiment in which people in Nebraska were asked to send a letter to someone in Boston. They were either asked to send it to someone in Boston directly or send the letter to someone who they figured would know someone in Boston who could receive the letter. On average, it took people six steps or took six people in order to get the letter to Boston. Although we may have many connections, it doesn't mean that these connections are particularly powerful. Our individual influence gets smaller, smaller the further and further we are removed from the connection. In other words, our connections have a wide reach. 
but the further away it spreads from us, the weaker it is. As our social networks get larger and larger and spread across the world, in part because of social networking sites, it actually takes less potential times to move from one person to another person to another person than it once did. Instead of six degrees of separation, we may be looking at five degrees of separation or four degrees of separation. Because social networks uh, allow us to connect all over the world using new technology, our degrees of separation are actually becoming smaller. So how are traditional social networks different from social networks using new technology? How are social networking sites really different from the idea of a social network? There are four main ways in which online social networks are different from previous social networks. That is in enormity, communality, specificity, and virtuality. Enormity refers to how online social networks are much, much larger and reach many more people than traditional social networks. Communality refers to the ability of online social networks to reach a wider range of people through channels previously unavailable. Specificity refers to an increase in the specific ties that can be formed between individuals. Virtuality refers to the unique property of so online social networks that allows for individuals to create and construct virtual identities. As previously mentioned in Chapter 7, so online social networks also allow for public displays of connection. That is, we can see who is connected to who. We cannot just see our own network, but also the networks of our friends and our friends' friends. So how do we build closeness online? One theory, media richness theory, suggests that communication channels can be understood by the number of nonverbal and social cues that they provide to the user, and that communication modes are more or less appropriate given the goal of communication. A potential problem with less rich mediums is their proclivity for equivocality. Equivocality is the potential for information to have more than one meaning, based on different contexts and potentially leading to confusion. Less rich mediums include things like unaddressed documents, such as bulk mail and posters. Higher up on the richness continuum are addressed but documents, such as letters and email. Much online communication falls into this realm in terms of text. A further on the continuum is two-way radio, being able to hear someone's voice, but potentially asynchronously. Up higher on the richness scale is talking on the telephone. There are more nonverbal cues, and you're talking synchronously. Up even higher is video conferencing. Now you can see the person you're talking to. You can witness some of their body language. And highest on the continuum of media richness is face-to-face -face communication, as this contains the most and maximum number of nonverbal cues. Given the limitations of mediums low in richness as proposed by media richness theory, how can we communicate effectively online? One answer is social information processing theory, SIPT, which suggests that people use information to reduce uncertainty in order to form relationships and that the medium through which they communicate affects how, how those relationships form, but doesn't affect whether or not the relationship forms itself. Computer-mediated communication tends to take longer for people to talk. Typing and reading just simply takes longer than talking. Research on relationships formed through computer-mediated communication indicates that, as such, the formation of relationships tends to take a little longer, but ends up being of the same quality as relationships formed offline, given enough time. Communication cues also just aren't absent in computer-mediated communication. Instead, we find ways of working around the lack of nonverbal communication cues. Given the lack of nonverbals, users have found a way of interjecting nonverbals into the textual medium, such as the use of chronomics and emoticons. Chronomics is the intentional use of pauses in time in order to indicate hesitation or disinterest. Think about it, has someone ever waited a long time to respond to a message you sent them? Maybe they were trying to tell you something non-verbally. Emoticons are combinations of keyboard symbols to resemble facial expressions. It all depends on the degree of equivocality of a message. Adding nonverbal cues, or these different types of ways we assume nonverbal cues in textual environments, can help make a message more or less clear to reduce the potential for equivocality. CMC in action, I less than three U. 
Fellow citizens, I believe there is no precedent for my appearing before you in this occasion. Applause. But it is also true that there is no precedent for your being here yourselves. Applause and laughter. And I offer copy of a speech by Abraham Lincoln dated August 7th, 1862. If you notice in this quote, there's actually an emoticon. It's a semicolon and a parenthesis. Emoticons themselves aren't even that new, and they have possibly been around for a very long time. Social information processing theory suggests that online relationships take longer to form. But have you ever felt very close to someone that you met online without really knowing them for very long? Social information processing theory, or SIP, suggests that we sort of SIP our relationships. We take them in at smaller little doses, one at a time, and that's why it takes longer for online relationships to form in comparison to face-to-face -face relationships. Is it possible that we could gulp relationships online and make them form even faster than our face-to-face -face relationships? Instead of sipping our relationships online, the hyperpersonal model of computer-mediated communication suggests that online communication isn't personal. It can be hyperpersonal. Instead of just sipping here, we're gulping. How could online relationships form so fast? There are four parts to the explanation of the hyperpersonal model. First of all, the sender of a message online puts out the best version of him or herself. Online, we can sort of flub our information about us a little bit, as mentioned in Chapter 7. Next, receivers of a message tend to view the sender very positively and idealize them because the sender is sending a very, very positive version of themselves, so of course we like them. Next, computer-mediated communication allows for more control over messages. You can edit, stop, and think about what you want to say before you say it. So our messages tend to be highly constructed and well thought out. Finally, computer communicators end up in a feedback loop of positive self-presentation and evaluation. That is, senders are always putting out a positive version of themselves, and receivers are always responding to that message positively and idealizing the sender. But if everyone is doing this, and everyone is going back and forth, feeling good about themselves and feeling good about the other person, so this can cause us to develop relationships very quickly because we're essentially showing off an idealized version of ourselves. Many argue that authentic social interactions cannot happen using computer-mediated communication. Yet these arguments forget that human goals do not necessarily change from face-to-face -to, -face to computer mediated communication. A lack of communication cues can actually speed up the online relationships as senders and receivers idealize each other in the absence of physical contact, as mentioned in the hyperpersonal model. Questions for the crowd. Have you ever made a friend online who you've never actually met in person? How difficult was this friendship to create? How difficult was it to sustain? Can you think of situations in which you would prefer an online computer-mediated interaction to an offline face-to-face -face one? Do you think it's appropriate to break up with somebody via text message? What about firing an employee? Has it ever happened to you before? Share your answers to these questions on Twitter using the hashtag MediaAsATool hashtag or in our official Facebook group linked below. You might even get an answer from the authors directly.